Kia ora. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Touch Compass's uh, fifth in our second annual international webinar series um, with Claire Cunningham. I'm going to uh, pass it over to JT, our general manager, to open up the space with Karakia. Kia ora tato, ko uh, John Tami Hirikimi is tōku noa, John Tami Hirikimi is uh, General Manager Kai Whakahare Mātua or Touch Compass. Uh, very quickly, prior to uh, kicking off with our karakia today, a quick introduction. Um, I am an egg-shaped six-foot-two uh, white Euro male um, who presents as Pākehā but is deeply rooted in Ngāti Parauki Mataura. Uh, te whakatohia, te aitanga mate, nga te rua e te whanau rua tōpiri. Uh, my biculturalism is really important and what we're sharing today um, in this choreography of kia kōrero is uh, hugely important. Kia, um, respect, uh, reciprocity of feeling and experience is a huge part of te ao Māori, so I'm really pleased to be here to help open uh, this beautiful corridor and to um, to share this with you. Unihia te pō, te pō whiri marama, tōma ki a ta ao, ta ao whatu tangata, tātai ki rōnga, tātai ki rāro, tātai a haurau, haumie, kūie, tāikie. Right. From darkness and confusion comes the light of understanding. From our understanding of our world comes unity as people. We are interwoven, connected with what is above us, what is below us, and what surrounds us. This brings us together, allied, forward as one. Kia ora tato. Enjoy this korero rero. I know I will. Thank you so much, John. Uh, kia ora and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Izzy, I'm the creative producer here at Touch Compass. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm a Pākehā person with long brown curly hair, but it's tied up in a bun today. I've got my big black uh, headphones on, white glasses frames, and my black Touch Compass t-shirt because repping the brand. And I've got our Touch Compass logo behind me on the screen. Uh, welcome, welcome to our second annual uh, international webinar series um, and the fifth and final uh, in the series for this year, Claire Cunningham. We are so very excited for this Korero Rero. Before we begin, there's just a little bit of housekeeping I wanted to go over. Um, first of all, um, make sure that uh, your microphones are on mute, please, throughout the conversation. At the end, uh, we will invite everyone back into the space to, to ask questions, to engage, um, and you can either do this over the chat or you can turn your mic back on and put your hand up and, and ask a question. Um, if uh, you have, you can have your camera on or off, whatever makes you most comfortable. However, if you're seeing a screen just filled with empty, empty videos and you want to turn those off, you can go up to the top right corner where it says view and you can click hide non-video participants. Uh, Zan, who's uh, managing the back of house right now, will be um, spotlighting the speakers who are speaking and of course our wonderful NZSL interpreters who are joining us today from Platform Interpreting. Um, so as I said, we'll be doing a Q&A towards the end of a session, but if a, a question comes to you in the middle, uh, feel free to pop it in the chat, either publicly, or if you want to send it anonymously through to me, please feel free. If you're watching on Facebook Live, also hello and welcome. Zan will be managing the chat on Facebook Live, so same thing. If you have any questions, pop it in the chat. Um, if you're joining us, Later down the road, welcome. This will be up um, probably within four days to a, a, maybe a week of the recording up on our YouTube page with all our other webinar series um, fully captioned. Um, of course, if there's this is a, a comfortable space, so if you need to come and go from, from your video camera or, or anything at all, please feel free. And if there's anything we can do throughout this to make the experience more enjoyable, uh, to make it more accessible, um, or you just want to touch base, please don't hesitate to do so. Just pop it in the chat. 
Um, I think that's about everything. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Suzanne Cowan of our ADP. Uh, I beg your pardon. I'm actually starting with Lucy. I'm going to pass it over to Lucy Faeva of our Artistic Direction panel, who will introduce herself. Mela Lava, welcome, Claire. It's nice to see you on Zoom. I'm Lucy. I am a Samoan, European and Kiwi artist performer. I am sitting here in my living room in my power chair. I've got my hair in a bun and I'm wearing a blue top. And also I use an iPad to communicate. I've been performing for 26 years with Touch Compass and also as an independent collaborator. Thanks. Kia ora, Lucy. Uh, tēnei te mi atu ki a koutou. Uh, ko Rodney Bell, tēnei. My name is Rodney Bell, and I'm a pr uh, proud team member of the Artistic Direction Panel alongside Lucy and, and Suzanne. I, uh, I sit here with a white shirt on that's got fine stripes on it, and I have a tiki hanging around my neck, a, a greenstone tiki, and I have my hair tied back, my curly brown hair. I'm brown skin, brown eyes, and sit here as a proud Māori boy. Ko tainui te waka, ko Ngāti manya poto te iwi, ko Ngāti rora te hapu. Nō reira, tēnei te mi atu ki a koutou. A wholehearted greetings to all. And Claire, tēnei te mi atu ki a koe, Claire. A wholehearted greeting to you, Claire, and, and very excited to um, uh, share this virtual breath with you. And also, uh, hear about your amazing legacy that you've created in your life. And to JT, thank you, JT, for coking us with our karakia. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora tato, ko Suzanne Kauna Ho. I'm of European, um, English, Irish, Scottish descent. Um, I have light brown hair. I also have an oval shaped face. Um, I'm also sitting here in my wheelchair in my home here in Grey Lynn, Auckland. Um, I, um, I'm wearing a black and white um, jacket um, with little white stripes and flecks through the jacket. And I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I've been working with Touch Compass um, for many years and um, as an artist and as a collaborator and uh, now I'm part of the artistic direction panel with Lucy and Rodney. Um, so without um, further ado, I just want to um, welcome you Claire and um, so excited to be here and uh, really looking forward to hearing about your choreography of care and um, all the exciting things that you're doing. So I'll now pass it to you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. That's uh, one of the nicest online welcomes and one of the warmest online spaces I think I've ever been invited into. And I really appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, this is the voice of Claire Cunningham and the Scottish accent of Claire Cunningham, if you're just listening. Um, I am a, a short, white, queer woman. I'm about, I don't know, are you metric out in, in New Zealand or feet and inches? I'm about one, one metre fifty so, uh, tall, uh, which is also about a crutch and a half high, is how I also like to, to think of that. Um, I have a very dark brown hair with a lot of grey now in it. Uh, I'm wearing my glasses today and um, today I'm also wearing, I'm wearing a very bright blue uh, jumper, which was a gift from one of my best friends during one of the lockdowns. They sent this as a Christmas present, so it was, it was almost like getting a Christmas hug. Um, uh, my bright blue jumper and jeans. Um, in, just over my shoulder are my crutches, which are sort of grey elbow crutches. They're very, what, what would be described over here, sort of NHS standard, National Health Service, sort of bog standard, old fashioned um, crutches, um, which are my sort of 
companions, my life companions, but I also consider them part of my queer quadruped, meaning four-legged body. Um, I am sitting in my very bright orange painted room um, in my house, which is just outside Glasgow in Scotland, uh, with my happiest houseplant uh, kind of tumbling down the shelves behind me. And with a, a little sign behind me, a reminder to myself that says relentless, and in very small words, effing, relentless effing kindness, um, which is a useful thing uh, that I use to remind myself sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I might just, I am a- We might just yeah, have I'm a change a, of interpreters now, if it's okay. Of course. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I might just ask to sort of uh, queue up. Uh, there's a little video that I made a couple, uh, about two years ago, uh, which gives you a little sense of my movement vocabulary um, and also a little bit of some of my sort of values and thinkings. Uh, I'll maybe just share that with you um, as another means of introduction. So thanks, Sam. Go ahead. Uh, or Izzy. When I make a theatre performance, I'm trying to sort of create a space that welcomes a really wide range of people and trying to, trying to notice who's not there, trying to notice who's missing. I think it's more as I've gotten older that I really understand that there is an activism within the work. I think I recognise that there is an activism there and a choice to focus on the specificity and the skills of disabled bodies and to actually choose to focus on the techniques inherent within disabled bodies and how we experience the world and, and really also how to frame that choreographically. But there's activism in choosing to make visible and to identify as disabled and to sort of claim that as a cultural identity as well as a choreographic identity actually it has inherent value and that actually is a for me is also a, a really creative source and a creative um, lens on the world that I have I think I'm at that point in my career where I'm really beginning to see younger artists and new art, new disabled artists particularly beginning to emerge and that's really exciting. I guess I sort of subscribe to this idea that as theatre makers, we, we're building our utopias each time that we try to make work. I, I would just hope that we start to see f a far wider range of work that really welcomes more people, whether it's into theatre spaces or or maybe the, the important thing is also to get out of the theatre spaces because in my experience the problem is that the theatre spaces have been designed for a very particular set of people and bodies and have made a lot of people not welcome. So I think it's also time to start thinking about where we want to meet people and maybe getting out of, getting out of the old houses a little bit more often and meeting people where they are. Thank you, Claire, for that beautiful video. Um, it gives us a really great starting place, I think. Um, and I just wondered if you might want to lead with, you know, where what's exciting you at the moment. And um, we definitely want to hear about your choreography of care, but what's on top for you? What would you most like to start with? Ooh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, where would I start? There's there's many things that excite me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm I think I am excited at seeing so many more 
uh, disabled makers and disabled led work and and really starting to I think just the the huge sort of shift in aesthetics that it's bringing to work um, in terms of like yeah there's just such an incredible sort of range of of work that's beginning to emerge that historically I think there was a lot of in the UK anyway there was a lot of companies that were dominant and were quite influenced from sort of quite if I think particularly of like dance anyway where I've worked more recently being quite sort of influenced by very established aesthetics and um and classical dance techniques and codified technique and uh, ways that bodies uh contem even contemporary dance that was sort of in theory sort of pushing against those things still became very um traditional in a lot of ways um and so i think i'm getting quite excited certainly uh, i'm I, my knowledge of what's emerging maybe um in your part of the world is probably a bit ignorant and i i would love to learn much more about who's it, what's going on over there but certainly in europe um beginning to see far more sort of independent makers and and makers actually not just performers but really people starting to make work um um yeah i think that's that's something that is exciting me and i think beginning to sort of travel again and, and begin to meet more artists again, because I feel like I've been in um, quite a bubble for the last two years. And it's been good. These last two years of being sort of still or in one place has been wonderful. And it's been a great opportunity to think a lot about my practice and start to articulate things like this idea of a, a choreography of care was something that was emerging over a couple of years. It was very much an idea that I was working on when I made my last show, which was a piece, an ensemble piece called Thank You Very Much, like 2019. That was very formative in terms of the thinking of how I was trying to work was what is this, what is it to work with care and how do we do it? And does it shape the material? But being sort of still and not performing for a while has been useful to sort of go, how do I explain what I mean by these? <laughs> um, these, th these thoughts or how do I break it down into what actually happened um, in the room or um, so I think things that are exciting are the hope that we take that show back out there's a hope that we will tour it again next year there's a plan to tour it next year and that's exciting because yeah I'm not perform I'm I am a performer first and foremost um, much as I like presenting and talking and I can talk till the cows come home um, but it's difficult being off the stage and and I'm missing that that's taking quite a while to come back. But also it's the trickiness of making a work that was quite big. It was an amazing opportunity to make an ensemble show, but that comes with a challenge of that costs a lot of money <laughs> and it's harder to tour. So it's there's a kind of a catch to that as well. And, you know, trying to make sure it was a company entirely that all the performer performing company were all disabled artists. Um, and so make it this this idea of trying to work with care um, is also very tied to taking time, taking the t t that things take the time they take and that planning takes time as well. So, um, yeah, it's also that like just the, the the sort of making sure that as much as possible is is arranged in advance um in order to try and make everything work for everyone and that yeah that that's that's what we're doing at the moment is beginning to sort of plan for taking the work back out next year um and there's also a sort of new teaching position that i'm being um having uh, in berlin if for the next uh, for a while which um that's quite a new sort of perspective for me is like how i engage in a university position and how i open up my practice as an artist to to students um and that's quite a that's going to be a new thing for me to think how do i bring um students into the way that i work because i've historically also been quite private when i work um so i'm trying to think how that's going to 
um, yeah, how to open up what it is that I do, having not also done anything, like I've not made work since 2019. So yeah, I'm also quite excited about starting to make again, you know. Absolutely. Um, which university are you working with? Uh, it'll be a universe, it's, it's not entirely formally announced yet, so, but it will be with a university in Berlin. Um, uh, so with an arts programme there, so. We'll keep you updated. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, really to hear more about that. Um, so yeah. just getting back to the choreography of care, you've talked about timing being um, time space of people with disabilities being a huge component. Do you want to elaborate a bit more on some other components just so we can get a bit of a window into the complexity of how you're approaching that choreography of care? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, I, I kind of, I, I began to use this term, what is the choreography of care? What is the choreography of care? Um, and while it's a, a name that I sort of conjured, it's very much, I want to be, I want to be really clear, it's very much the thinking of a constellation of people and the experience of many, many people. And it's a constantly evolving um, idea, really, and research. Um, so it's not like, it's not a, thing that's sort of like you know <laughs> I'm not laying claim to something um but it's been a useful way for me to think about what it is that I'm doing and so some of the uh, I began to sort of think in terms of um frames is one of the ways that I kind of think of it so um uh, the the sort of frames that I I use to help me think about my practice are the idea of design as care uh, communication as care, time as care, performance itself as care, and then how all that sort of intersects to be, uh, to kind of what you mentioned already, the complexity of care, where things um, also, where these things meet or sort of affect each other. Um, and so um, I'm going to, uh, a thing that I wrote, uh, I, uh, last year was just um, under those sorts of headings. So, for example, some of the questions I might uh, I kind of ask myself, maybe in process of like, so things like if I'm thinking about design as care, um, the idea of like how might the choice of where a performance takes place um, or the form it takes actually be an act of care. Um, design, uh, how might politics and trauma relating to clothing and body image be attended to as an act of care? Uh, how might the layout of an audience or the choices of seating be an act of care? Um, something I'm really interested in, how is the act of, uh, how, how is creating spaces that make it easy to leave an act of care? Really interested in how we make it easier for people to leave which is quite antithetical, I think, to a lot of performance makers. Um, but I think as disabled people in groups, we kind of understand the importance of what that might mean. Um, time as care, obviously, when you're coming to scheduling of projects, and um, I think this was something that Lucy and I had talked about, like the time that you're taking with your next project, the two years, I seem to remember, is a beautiful um, to, to recognize that and to be able to work in that way. Um, I was one of the things with, when making Thank You Very Much, that was kind of a bit about time as care was also about the idea of like, how might I, I'm not saying I was successful with this, but I was interested in how might I make material, like choreographic material, if we're literally talking about traditional ideas of choreography, how might you make material that can uh, shift and alter uh, in, in time um, or also can alter with a body, with a body changing, with a body aging, with the fluctuation of a body's energy, um, for example, or the where it's at one day to the next. Um, I think with some scores, I'm more successful than in others. Um, but I began to notice, certainly with some of my solo work, 
that began to manifest with things like just choosing to make musical soundtracks that uh, maybe even didn't have a hard stop and a hard ending, that they segue or that they can they can be moderated and in, in and out of other into that the sections can be much more fluid and therefore it can really work with how my body is working or how long I want to do something for rather than it being like I have to go for three and a half minutes I have to go for seven minutes because you know <laughs> that's how long the music is um and then sometimes it's nice to kind of do that choose to do that but um but then I might make something it's like okay this is seven minutes and you can you you can modify this this choreographic score to work with the energy that you have today it's not got to look the same every night um so yeah i think time as care is intrinsically linked to energy as care obviously and, and as well um communication just, yeah sorry i was just sorry. wanting to on that i just wonder what those are of, examples <laughs> yeah no, just just I'm just really curious, actually, what kind of response you've got to that way of working. I mean, obviously, you're directing the process, so you're the one that calls the shots. But, you know, mm. I mean, have you any pushback from people that you've worked with around that sort of approach of, you know, um, that sort of fluidity of, um, you know, timing and um, and also, you know, fluctuating energy? I mean you know have other people embraced that in your processes or you know do you find that somehow there's a bit intrinsically a bit of resistance to that way of thinking not that i can but just to do a change of Sorry, interpreters if that's okay of course thank you i'm going to take a little drink take that Excuse me. Um, I don't really remember any instances of pushback. Um, I think I think people are quite relieved and quite surprised to be offered that sort of space and choice. Um, sometimes um, I think, uh, and again, I don't uh, don't feel like I get pushback. But where where you start to obviously have a like perhaps when you start to have to deal with maybe more technical things, like how long is this music track? How long do you, my, if I'm working with a composer of like, well, how long do you want this to be? Um, and how do we, or how do we make alternative versions or how do we make a um, material that can flex becomes part of uh, the process and can get a bit tricky because then, yeah, you have to also, um, be realistic about how you know that you're not um then asking that person to to spend so much time creating a much more complicated piece of work than you've budgeted to pay them you know so also that thing of like how uh working those things or like yeah how is the lighting going to work in terms of knowing when to transition a scene you know like what are the choices that you're making um in terms of that and I think that's again that I, I think it comes a lot to do with the uh, who's in the room who you've chosen to work with and people that are really excited to work in ways that have that live uh, that live performance that has a liveness you know that 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 there's an understanding of like it won't it's not trying to be exactly the same every night maybe um and people that enjoy that way of like, yes, I've programmed my lights, but I'm also very, I'm very happy to be ready to just hold this longer or shorten it and move to the next scene. And I don't see that as mistake. I don't see it as failure. I'm not annoyed. Uh, they're like, that's part of how this work flows. Um, so I think that's a lot often to do with, yeah, ch choosing to work with people that also want to work in those ways. Um, and find that more interesting to work in that way, actually, rather than seeing it as a challenge. They're more, oh, okay, yeah, I've got to, I've got to think how I'm going to cover that transition, and what am I going to do to transition from there to there, and um, 
how does that yeah people that are excited by by those things rather than um confronted by it yeah and you talked about communication being quite an important component as well yeah exactly and i mean yeah i think what's more what's more difficult for people is um is more me sort of like make it take, like me making up my mind that's a more difficult thing for my performers or my team to deal with of like me me uh finally making choices that's a much more problematic thing than them you know sort of being asked to work uh with scores or material that flexes is um is dealing with like me going oh do i work with, is that is that scene there or is it there or is it there and like um i think that's more when i cause trouble for people <laughs> it's with my procrastination of making decisions um yeah but i i think yeah it's a lot to do with yeah, people that are excited by that way of working. Awesome. So I think Lucy's got a question. <laughs> I saw some footage of her solo on Dance Umbrella. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And I like the concept of performing on the square stage where you incorporate the impressive aspects. Of course, Elvis Presley is brilliant and physically moving the pelvis in the X-ray line is very good. What was it like for you creating this piece? Thank you. Yeah, it's it's definitely exciting when people make you uh, a light up stage the same as Elvis Presley had. Um, so that's that's very exciting when you're like, really? Can I get a can I get a light up sixty eight stage? Um, yeah, I mean it's it was a it's one of these processes. It was a bit of everything. Um, it was so it's yeah. I mean it's a work that I I love very deeply and I'm very proud of it. Um, I'm really I love the company that we formed. It's an incredibly warm, caring company of people that came together. And that I think that's the thing of where it starts for me. Like the work, the work itself, yes, is important, but it's it's really about the people first and foremost. And I guess that's also about the people that I choose to work with or the people that choose to come on board with me are usually, I think, people that value the people over the project. And that's not to mean that they don't care, like they all care very deeply and are serious about their work, but they they don't lose sight of the people over the project. Um, we all want to make something that works and that's good and that we're proud of, but we're, it's more important that everybody is taken care of. Um, and so I think for me, it was first and foremost about the people in the room. Um, and I think I feel very happy that we we created a, an extraordinary sort of ensemble. It's it's and it's a big ensemble off the stage. It's like fifteen people on the road, um, and yeah, I mean, I I ended up I was sort of bringing my sort of fascination with Elvis into the into the room, um, and really enjoying seeing what it was to sort of give this over in some ways to other people but actually what that show was really more it wasn't so much a show about Elvis there was things about Elvis that I was interested in like what were things about his vocabulary that I felt had a cripness actually that I wanted to sort of reappropriate in a way um, or things about how he moved that I felt had a sort of synergy or a recognition from a disability experience um those were things that i found interesting of like why is the this person who is seen as um the way that they move is problematic and troublesome like okay that's something i think i feel like i recognize from disability experience it was fun to sort of be able to kind of share that with other people and go this is the strange connection that i'm making do you want to join me on this and play with this but then 
what I was more interested in with my work in recent years has become far more that rather than like watching Elvis on video, although I did do a little bit of that, I was more interested, I'm more interested in personal encounter um, in sort yeah. of, yeah, in, in sort of intimate interactions and like what it is to, if you spend time with somebody one-to-one, -one, how you learn to respect what they respect, how you learn to understand and care about mm. what they care about, even if it's very diff even if it's very removed from your own beliefs or your own cares, I can at least learn to care about that thing. And that was that was the thing about the tribute. Uh, so it became more about Elvis tribute artists. It became about people who impersonate Elvis rather mm -hmm. than Elvis and what it was to spend time with those people. Yeah. And the method was what if I send all of my performers to one of these tribute artists? And so rather than me telling you what you're gonna learn, you're gonna come back as an independent researcher and share with me what you learned. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna build the work based on what you learned rather than what, in, of course I'm filtering it, of course it's my work. So there's a degree of my choice that goes into what I pick, but, I really wanted it to be about what is it to also share my way of working with other mm. artists and create a show that's like, okay, I, what happens when these two people meet? And it's very different with each tribute artist and each performer. Um, and so there's a kind of fun about that and what it is to bring these people into the room with us. And for me, it's also grounded in this idea of you know, I'm, I'm, let me be really clear. Elvis is a very problematic figure. I'm not in any way sort of sanctifying him. I think there are things that I love about him and there are things that I hate and are very problematic. Yeah. I'm not about making a show about glorifying a big white cis alpha dude, you know, but what I was interested in is like what it is to engage with that sort of, um, that symbol or like, what he represents and what he means to these tribute artists rather than mm -hmm. what he actually means to me. Um, so it's a very fun topic as well. And it allowed me also to have great costumes, which normally I, I don't, I, I, yeah, I'm quite <laughs> plain and a bit vanilla with my costumes up until that point. So it was a really good chance to sort of, um, yeah, get some very I, I recommend it you know just once walking backstage in an Elvis jumpsuit is a pretty everybody should feel it just once <laughs> thanks Lucy hey Claire I have a question for you you know um uh, do you have a mentor or guardian or, or energies that you uh, draw upon to enhance your practice? Um, guardian, I've never, I've never thought in those terms before, but that's a very beautiful. I'm going to think about that a little bit more in the future. See what that. Um, I, I definitely have. There have been many people I think through my life that have sort of had mentorship roles. I think at different points in different ways. Um, I think, for example, uh, I talk quite often about, I'll write their name in the chat if it's helpful. I, I, um, so I, I worked, I work a lot with an American artist called Jess Curtis. Um, yeah, yeah, you would have known from San Francisco, of yeah, course. Yeah. yeah. Who is a, a white male non-disabled choreographer, San Francisco in Berlin. Um, and was kind of what he was the choreographer that sort of got me fascinated by dance and by movement uh, and the way that he brought me into working in movement is really foundational to the way a lot of the ways that I still work are things that I learned from Jess um, and then in later years we've went on and sort of made work together we kind of came back together as equals and go what happens if we work together now and it's it's been very interesting to realize that, particularly because I was bringing a lot of access practices with my work in, 
that he was getting a lot of learning from that side as well. And then I was also coming back to him with things he'd sort of given me years before and what was what I'd done with things or where I'd taken them. So I think Jess is a very, very important person in my life, as was, um, I'll also write it in the chat, Bill Shannon, who's maybe a name known to, to some of your audience, who, um, firstly, uh, yeah, all these, these white dude male Americans, um, but it, Bill is a, a disabled mm. dancer and a visual artist and um, thinker and philosopher and choreographer. Um, and extraordinary dancer uh, who dances on crutches and and he trained I trained with him for a while and so both Jess and Bill were very very instrumental in terms of my journey into dance and the, the kind of vocabulary I developed. Um, I would say in terms of that in terms of being a performer in terms of physical practice they are the most influential and then in terms I think of when I became a maker when I started to to make my own work um I began to work with a, a friend of mine Luke Pell who's the Luke that gave me the my, my jumper uh who is a, a just poet do a and, switch of interpreters sorry of course sorry I'm going to write Luke's name in the chat now as well um, Sorry, just for the interpreters, but thank you. Go ahead. Great, sorry. Uh, so Luke Pell, um, who is a poet and a performance maker uh, themselves, but also a dramaturg and works a lot with a variety, a lot of artists um, and whose practice as an artist is very much about working with other artists and sort of facilitating and um, supporting their, um, their, their practice. And so Luke began to work with me as a dramaturg back in like 2014, uh, but has continued to work with me since then. And it's just, yeah, it's, he's one of my best friends, but it's also a kind of extraordinary sort of working relationship because he kind of is dramaturg for my body of work for for many many years um and so it's not just about a show that we're making uh, i'm i'm kind of fortunate that like so part of our relationship is about taking time in my practice to spend time together and this is really about looking at the threads through my work like where it's been what's what's surfaced what's happening in order to kind of see where it's going um and so I often talk about uh, I often talk about Luke as being a bit like my lighthouse. Um, and yesterday we came up with the I, I made a typing error yesterday when I was writing and I was writing the word dramaturg, and I made a typo and I wrote the word dramaturg, and we've realised that actually that's what Luke is. He's he's more a dramaturg. Um, he's very much about helping me dream. Um, and so I think Luke is a huge sort of part of my, my work as well. So again, there's my work, Claire Cunningham works, Claire Cunningham performances and shows, but they're really not my work. They are very much, a, 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 as I say, look at, they're very much a constellation of a, a lot of people, but Luke is often quite a heart within a lot of the work. Um, and then recently I would say um, somebody I've, been talking with a lot and I've made a couple of audio works with is a, a person called uh, Julia Watts Belser, Professor Julia Watts Belser, actually, all right, in the chat. Um, uh, yeah. And Julia is a theologian and uh, a disabled scholar and theologian based in uh, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Mm. Uh, and they're a, a, just a fascinating, fasc they're like a crip, queer, feminist rabbi theologian. <laughs> um, mm. And 
extraordinary sort of person to to engage with and and somebody now that has become quite a sort of um a partner in dialogue um about and really opened up my thinking a lot um, as an artist particularly but also I think as as a person and a human being um, and and so I think that's a, certainly a, a relationship that has been really extraordinary to develop in the last couple of years and is a, a certainly a working relationship I want to keep developing um, and yeah we have a lot more plans to continue working together but I think yeah they are definitely some of the most influential people um, in my life. Yeah, thank you, Claire. And I just would thank like you. to um, acknowledge um, your, your your time and care. I really like that one because as we get um, obviously our bodies, because we love to dance, we love to move, but also having that opportunity to shift the work and shift it with your body is yeah. I really love it. I just say, like to acknowledge that, Claire. Thank you. Yeah, so I think good. also. It became the other way in which it, it, one of the processes or one of the things about making that work as well was also the fact that we we've we've realized we can change it if somebody's body changes if somebody suddenly is like i i, I don't want to do the, that anymore that doesn't work for me i'm not get, i'm not ever gonna ask somebody to do something they don't want to do um that was one of the first things as well it, when I met the performer, <laughs> I said, you never have to wear a costume that you don't want to wear. Yeah. And they were so shocked by this because they had all come out of repertory companies that were like, what? And I was like, yeah, I would never, I know, I have my such issues around clothing, you know? And, and I was like, I would never do that to somebody. It's like, if you're not comfortable with what you're wearing, you're not going to be comfortable on a stage. Um, and the same with the work. Like we found that we can change it. It's like, oh, this material is not right. You're not happy doing that right anymore. We can change it. And it's terrifying, let me say, as a choreographer and a director, it's not easy maybe to completely change material, but I've learned it's possible. And it's, um, we also had to change the work quite a lot for COVID and change, because there was quite a lot of audience interaction. And it was like, okay, yeah. That, that, yeah, I'd be a hypocrite if I thought I couldn't change the work to keep people safe. Like that's at the heart of the work. So yeah, we work out how to change the piece. And we'd, I made an entirely new ending to the show, which I thought was impossible, but it's like, no, it's, it's all possible if, yeah, if you have a good bunch of people. <laughs> and time, it takes time to change things though. That's the other thing. And nobody likes to give you money to change a show. They might give you money to make it, but they don't really like giving you money to change it. Um, we were fortunate that we had very good uh, producers. Um, but the reality of particularly working with disabled artists is that you're going to have to change work potentially. Mm -hmm. And one that, that's one of the things I'm also facing right now is I'm changing performers. And we make work that is so bespoke to people and bodies. So what happens when you have to replace a performer? Because I can't have somebody replicate material that was made for a very different body. So these, I think, are where things are tricky, but it's also what makes the work beautiful of like, this is where it's, it's you know, it's messy, but it's, it's also what makes the work more interesting to me. Um, yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, thank I'll, you. I'll pass you back to Suzanne. Oh my gosh, I wish we had like two or three hours. There are so many elements I want to pick up on, and <laughs> I'm aware that um, you know we're sort of coming towards the end of our time. Um, but actually, I'm just going to quickly ask this question in, or around um, Julia, her work and what ideas particularly has she brought to you? you? You sounded like it was very generative. Is there some thing in particular that you felt that um, you, you've been exploring mm. together? Um, we talk, yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about um, sort of crip experience and disability experience, and particularly in, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work that's about relationship to 
environment and moving through environment particularly um, and Julia's one of Julia's particular research um, focuses is about um, the sort of intersection between disability justice and climate justice or cl and climate crisis um, and also uh, disability justice and experience and emergency response. So she has a lot, if, if anyone's interested in that, she has a very new project and research project that's now online around that. So there's a lot of interesting things that we're sort of exploring from there in terms of how are there strategies actually for climate crisis that are embodied um, or like coming so much from disability knowledge and crip knowledge of how is, uh, how is spin theory an interesting model with which to look at sort of resource and managing resources and sustainability and energy crisis and all that sort of stuff. Um, these, um, I think, but one of the most thing, when I first worked with Julia back 2018, something like this, I interviewed her because I made a show about disability and faith called Guide Gods many years ago. And I asked, I interviewed her because I had not managed to include a section on Judaism and so I wanted to expand the show and I interviewed the Jewish community in Manchester and I interviewed Julia. And she talked quite specifically about the practice of Shabbat. Um, and that was a really fascinating moment for me, actually, the way that she shared the practice of Shabbat as being a day, um, 24 hours where you're not um, allowed to be productive basically, As, and talking about how this was a, a quite a liberatory, liberatory principle for disability community, particularly, you know, because you're no longer being judged on the basis of being valued for being productive. Um, and there was a lot of things around that that she shared that was really fascinating. But also one of the things that she said was just how the idea of Shabbat, and it obviously exists in lots of faiths, these sorts of ideas, but the way that she framed it around Judaism and Shabbat was this idea that in that story of why it exists is that the recognition that rest is part of the process of creation was the thing that she shared with me. And that was just, as an artist particularly, I, I was just like, hmm, okay. That, um, that was really sort of mind blowing to me to kind of, you know, to think about actually, yeah, these, to get away from this thing of like the guilt of feeling like I'm not producing, I'm not working. If I'm not work, not working in the way that I think I'm supposed to work as an artist, then I'm not working. But actually realizing that the time between working and the time between projects is also feeding the work, it's also essential to the creation of the work and and that was one of the things that I particularly has been I guess yeah thinking about rest more generally is something that a lot of people are beginning to understand more widely the importance of but particularly thinking of it as an artist in relation to artistic process um that it is part of the process to actually rest was like that was really hugely important for me um, to give myself permission to take space in between um, to let the fields be fallow for a little bit actually um, yeah that's been really helpful wow that's amazing <laughs> that uh, um, I think you know disability or crip knowledge comes together with you know um, traditional religious practices and mm. you know this coming together in this and sort of deepening that understanding of actually what works for us and, and what we need to do. Um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, I guess we're getting to the time where we'll, um, it's an opportunity for other people to ask questions. <laughs> um, anyone that's listening in and, and, um, and has some questions. And I think, Izzy, um, you're going to lead that process. Good everyone, Claire, thank you so much for your 
wisdom and knowledge. It's really amazing to listen to. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat already, but before I go to them, does anyone want to ask a question live or I can uh, start reading off from my list? I will start from my list and if anyone wants to ask a question, pop up your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, so this is a question from actually inside Touch Compass, um, and you have to excuse that I keep looking to the side. I have a second screen where the questions are stored. Um, but, uh, so care and respect is a priority for us with our artists and our participants. In te reo, our korowai o tatafai, the cloak of care and nurture that we wrap around our artists and projects. When do you, Claire, yourself feel the most cared for in your work? What have been the pointers for you personally that say, yes, that's what artist care is? And who is doing it well, in your opinion, right now? Hmm. Wow, well, these, yeah, sometimes I, I need a lot more time to think about questions. <laughs> when do I feel really cared for and nurtured? Oh. interesting how do I, how do I notice that um I think um change interpreters please I think this is this is maybe something I, I think is that you've hit on something that I really need to work on, because I think one of the things that I realize, particularly as somebody who's, as I said, who's seen as a solo artist, but actually has ended up in a position where I'm almost I'm kind of like a company, but not officially. I now have a big group of people that I like working with and that I feel responsible for and and uh want to take care of um but i think i struggle to know how to take care of myself in that um and that i spend so much of my time trying to make sure that everyone else is okay um i think i mean i i feel really um i have an extraordinary sort of producing team i'm very very fortunate that i have two producers um uh, Nadia Diaz and uh, Vicky Wilson, and um, and I think that's such an unusual situation for most freelance artists. It's and it's even more so for disabled freelance artists. Um, and what that does for me, so in a lot of ways, I feel for years, for many years since, particularly since Nadia came on board as my producer. I always feel cared for and nurtured actually um, in, a, in a sort of zooming out sort of way. Um, because what I recognized in the last year, I, I, what I began to understand is that I am, I am very protected from a lot of the labor that a disabled artist and a freelance artist needs to go through. Um, they, they take a lot of that labor from me and they also become a sort of buffer for me against a lot of the ableism in the world that I would face as a disabled artist because I have them who are the sort of first contact they are the sort of they're the people that are sort of initiating a lot of that email negotiating um, that I'm not having to do anymore you know um, all that sort of like I don't have to justify how I need to travel somewhere I don't have to justify that I need when I need assistance or why I want a bath in my room or anything. You know? um, and they mostly don't have to justify it either, but they are the people that will do that work if necessary. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I feel extraordinarily well cared for by, by them, um, by the fact also that they know, <laughs> they know me so well that they know how to almost they know the answer to a question a lot of the time before they need to ask it you know so like if i get invited 
uh, to make like people some I'm very fortunate that I get invitations to do certain things or people ask would you be interested in making work for children and they're kind of like my producers know that that's probably something I'm never going to touch with a a, bar, a very long crutch um I'm not that comfortable with children so it's un, I never say never you know I'm learning you never say never but it's unlikely that I'm going to want to work with kids and young people um so it's just also like they know um they know what I need um and so much uh, so much of what I I don't have to think of so much stuff because they do it all, they know it all now um, ahead of me and they're sort of laying the path. Um, and that's an extraordinary situation um, for any artist, but it's also a lot about, like we said, it comes back to time. Like we now have been working together for years and um, it's kind of wonderful to be able to cultivate long working relationships with people. Um, I think, yeah, in terms of that, like I feel I'm nurtured by all of the collaborators that I'm fortunate to work with. I, th you know, I feel nurtured by the fact that they choose to still work with me is the most extraordinary compliment any of them can pay. Um, and I feel very well looked after by them when we are working together. Um, so, yeah, I think I am one of these people also who finds who's built family through who they work with. Um, I heard uh, Disability Arts Online did their podcast recently and one of the one of the people was talking about workshops as like relationships and workshops like family and, and workshop and I was like oh workshops I guess that's kind of what I have um, <laughs> with a lot of people because yeah it's it's very yeah I like that term, the cloak of care and nurture, though I'm going to think about that even more. Wonderful. Um, so another question we have is, so this is in reference you mentioned in your film at the very beginning about the new generation of disabled artists. Um, how can we uh, train up a new generation of disabled artistic leaders as well as practitioners? Do you have any tips or thoughts on, on how to train up leadership? Um, I think the thing that I'm understanding more, like, because this question of, like, people ask me often about being a leader, and I don't, it's that thing of, like, I don't know that I've, I don't think of myself in that way, um, but I recognise that it's not, it's, it's sometimes just be, being, when you end up having to be the first doing something quite often, then you're sometimes sort of perceived as, as a leader. Um, and that doesn't always equip you for leading. It doesn't, it's not, yeah. And so I think there's something about, yeah, exactly. I think this question is really important about how do we not just presume that because people are doing it, that they're learning leadership and we don't sort of, push people into those situations either that, that don't want, like, cause not everybody should, not everyone should have to lead or be a leader. Um, there's nothing wrong with not being a leader. Um, if whatever that even means. Um, but I think it has to, maybe it has to do with how do we find ways in which people are much more alongside and not alone in those, in practices. Um, which I feel like I feel like is something that your company's really built on <laughs> um, is that it feels like it is such a, a family and and that it's so built around care um, and being alongside. Um, so I think yeah, there is something about also what yeah Rodney was talking about with this about mentorship. And thinking what form like because I think we often think of mentorship as sounding like a quite formal arrangement and when I think about mentors in my life like sometimes it's been a formal thing like literally also I've paid someone to be a mentor for a, a project or an idea sometimes it's just it's the person you're working with um 
sometimes it's somebody that you're having coffee you're meeting for coffee like i think it's also like how is it that we realize that we can be sort of alongside and um training can actually be very very different and doesn't have to be through sort of formalized um structures maybe i'm not always very good yeah. at the sort of meta question so i apologize <laughs> well, quite good if you a... ask me about <laughs> the costumes of my show i get a bit crappy when people ask me about like so leadership in europe i'm like ah oh. um <laughs> my producer's much better at these sort of meta um put, uh, these bigger questions um or that i'm better at them if i go take them away for a week and think about them but Mm. Well, here's here's a very uh, concrete question for you, which has come through around um, uh, actually building your shows. So um, how have you developed relationships with designers and crew, particularly crew while you're on tour who might not have good understandings of disability consciousness? Um, can you tell us what it's like to, you know, tour technically? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's, yeah, again, that's often about having found a good technical crew of our own to, to go with that, that we know can be, again, a buffer with a house crew, for example, if necessary. Um, and that maybe mean that we are not as performers, for example, having to deal always so directly with the, the house crew, for example, all of them. Um, there is a definitely a difficulty at times with, so for example, we do put out very quite detailed access riders as well. You know, there's technical riders that always go with the show, all the technical equipment and that's required. Um, and then we have, access riders that go alongside that um and then we often have access handbooks kind of in a way that go with the show that is about the requirements of the venue to provide the sign language to provide uh, whether it's to provide a local ad if it's not in the show um and that will often say the things that this is what the marketing department needs to think about and look at and this is what your technical but there's a tendency that those things don't filter through to the technical department um and we're still sometimes trying to find ways in which technical departments realize that these things apply to them too um i think sometimes it's also just about we are it, it it's that thing sometimes as well of like it's it's so built into what the show is that sometimes that makes it easier a little bit of like this layout is the show and it's laid out this way partly for access but we don't have to explain that to them it's like no the show is on stage you know well, I know it's all on stage because I want everybody to be all on the same level and not people up in the, the risers or the bleachers or tribune or whatever you call it. Or we've said, I mean, I, where we do sometimes have fun <clears throat> is I, we insist on universal access to the, to ent or universal entrance, sorry, is what I mean. Uh, so everybody comes in the same way. And so for example, I've started in Germany, a lot of the time my invitations to work in recent years are Germany. And we're starting to be invited into the very big traditional houses in Germany, because Germany is now beginning uh, there's to invest funds in disabled artists the last few years. That's beginning to really grow. So a lot of the, the bigger houses and the older houses are starting to go, oh, right, OK, uh, we should do we should get some disabled artists on the stage. Um, and that's where, yeah, you start to sort of hit a thing of like the technical department being like, what, you want all the audience to enter backstage? And it's like, well, yeah, if that's the only entrance with no stairs, then all the audience are coming through your backstage. Um, but trying, I think it's this thing of like, we've found, we have found ways in which it's about talking about that is, it's not, a, it's part of the work um like 
people get to stay behind like I made a show the F- guide gods years ago and it was like yes people stay for 45 minutes after the show to have a cup of tea and you would get pressure sometimes from houses oh no okay well it's only a cup of tea we can shorten it to half an hour it's like no that is that is also the show you know and so sometimes I think yeah I think over the years we're still trying to find methods as to how we how we broker that with the technical and the production managers of houses but to get far more of them I think trying to make them understand it's about the aesthetics of the show itself um or a a way of yeah we need this much time we need a two-day get-in you know um and that's about needing the time it takes for our technical staff but also for performers to feel safe navigating a new space or whatever and and how do you just try and build it into what the show actually is um but I know that that's easier said than done um I think we might just have a change of interpreters now of course and that's yeah that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, I'm just noticing we are quite tight on time. We have a minute left. Um, so, but there is quite a few more questions. I just want to throw a really, really quick one to you, which is what's next? <laughs> what's next? Where am I? This, uh, it's nearly December. What do I do? I go to Germany uh, I've, and I, um, I have a lecture demo performance that I created a few years ago, which is just a sort of solo um one hour uh sometimes a bit longer because i talk too much as you hear um a lecture demo show which kind of takes you through my vocabulary from jess and bill and how that built um and a little bit into like how working with crutches becomes a sort of way of work thinking choreographically um and how it shapes new work and so yeah, that's the show that I've been taking out quite a lot. And that goes out in a week or two to Belgium and to Germany and some workshops with some dance, like sometimes dance professionals, sometimes dance students or local community. So that's what's kind of next for me before Christmas anyway, is a little bit of that. Wonderful. Sounds like a busy end of the year. Um, well, We are out of time. So just a huge thank you, Claire, for all your wisdom. And thank you for the Touch Compass ADP for for hosting tonight. Um, Do you have anything else you wanted to share, ADP, before we close out? Oh, again, yeah, just to reiterate, um, it's so wonderful to see you again and um, lovely to unpack some of um, your working practices and your ideas. And it's given me a lot to think about. so um yeah um so look forward to next time absolutely thank you so so much uh yeah suzanne lucy rodney izzy everyone john it's just been such a pleasure i really really um yeah i you've made me feel so welcome i'd love to have so many more conversations with you and i really really hope to get one in person with you uh, sometime in the not so distant future I really would love to to, to be there with you so Abs- thank you yeah. so much absolutely we'd love uh, a collaboration between Claire Cunningham and Touch <laughs> Compass at some point in the future <laughs> Um, so again, once more, a thousand times, thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining in and watching. Um, as I mentioned, if you're watching online in the coming weeks, hi, we're glad you found us. Enjoy the enjoy the conversation. Um, if you want to know more about Touch Compass, you can always go to our website, touchcompass.co.nz. Um, thanks so much for joining. And I'll pass it back to John to close us out with a karakia. All right. Have a great day. Kia tato. And uh, to to clear, especially Namihi Nui Mototoko Kitiko Papahitine Wa. Thank you so much for your support, your sharing, your fakaro, your thoughts um, with with us and those who are viewing now and will view in the future. Again, we um, we really preach the time and space, and we want to ensure that accessibility is more than ramps. Um, Kia ora, kia ora. Uh, I'll close this out now.
um, appropriately, this karakia feels right. <laughs> kia whakaria te tapu, ka wātea ai te ara, ka tūriki whakataa ai, ka tūriki whakataa ai, haungie, huie, taikie. For the time being, restrictions are cast aside. The path is now clear for us to return. Um, stronger and connected in this korero, in this conversation, um, taking these thoughts, these feelings forward, allies us in heart and mind, and we move forward together from here. And to uh, shout out to Izzy, touchcompass.com org.nz and um, we absolutely would love to collaborate <laughs> with you in the future clear so let's keep the communication lines open uh, on behalf of uh, Tefano or Touch Campus thank you thank you to our ADP for your insightful sharing your very apt and pertinent questions and um, as we say we, we really are on a journey about care here and uh, to get your insights clear has been hugely valuable, both from a leadership perspective, but also from the way we engage, connect, and look after our artists. We're all on the journey. Kia ora.